Welcome back to part two of your microbiome for better or for worse. Today's subject, looking at gut bacteria and foods. I'm sure many of you have been informed of some potential probiotic foods that are available readily um, today if you go to the health food stores or if you even make them yourself, such as the sour creams, sauerkrauts, pickles, and other types of probiotics. Are all of these beneficial though? That's my question for us today. If not, which one should we avoid and why? For what reasons? We've already learned that there are beneficial organisms that uh, kind of are the creme de la, de la creme of probiotics, which would be the lactobacillus um, bacteria that are homofermenting, that are pr producing mainly lactic acid, correct? And we've seen that when we start adding these other things like ethanol, acetic acid, uh, carbon dioxide, we can start to have problems with tissue breakdown there in the colon. So we're gonna look at some foods, we're gonna look at some bacteria, we're gonna look at some uh, fungi as well in this uh, second part of this presentation. But before we do that, I want to tell you something. There are foods that we can eat that could help us and there are foods that we can eat that could hurt us. And in the beginning, God gave us a diet, the Genesis diet, consisting of fruits and vegetables. Until this day, modern research has not shown that there is any diet that is better for the human body than this original diet. And so I want to encourage you, if we want to really bring about the best result in our colon, we need to eat more of these things. Get back to the fruits and the vegetables that God has given us. Studies have found just eating a banana a day increases the amount of bifidobacteria that are there in the colon, which are a health-promoting bacteria. Other research shows that raw honey is rich in probiotic organisms. What happens when we start eating other things? Well, it's interesting. Cheese, for instance. One study found that half or 51% of the cheese isolates, the bacteria that were cultured from this cheese, were identified as heterofermentive. One of the most hurtful types of foods is actually not a specific food, but a actual diet. You've heard of the high protein diet? One of the worst things that we can do to our colon. This is the reason why. Because of something called proteolytic fermentation. And so the bacteria are gonna have to focus their efforts on not the sugars, not the saccharolytic fermentation, but they're gonna actually have to go to the proteins and start breaking those down. And as I mentioned on night one, this doesn't turn out to be a very nice fermentation. In fact, toxic metabolites such as ammonia, different types of amines, phenols, and sulfides greatly increase the destruction that can happen in the colon. Also, even in a normal diet, let's say we're not eating a high protein diet, but let's say we have protein there in the diet, undigested protein. Even if we have other foods to eat for the bacteria, if we have delayed transit time, over here they're gonna start eating that protein. And so all along this area, even in a healthy diet with delayed transit time, you have proteolytic fermentation and you greatly increase the risk of cancer and even things like leaky gut. So transit time is key, but diet is key as well. It's an interesting fact here. If you want to know if you have proteolytic fermentation going on in your small intestine or your large intestine, there's a simple test. It's a breath test. And this is what it's testing for. The compound methane, which is the number one component of natural gas. You know, the number two component is ethanol. So methane and ethanol, the combined um, gases that constitute natural gas. Can you believe that? That we can actually be exhaling natural gas because we're eating too much protein? That's amazing. Now methane may seem like a uh, not too harmful of a substance, but it's an asphyxiant. It actually will compete with oxygen. And so you could have imbalanced flora, um, you could have imbalances in the health of the colon 
because you have this chemical that shouldn't be found there in this high of amounts. Not so much that you're actually breathing out this methane. Studies refer to these individuals as methane breathers because there's this detectable amount of methane found in their, um, in their breath. So this type of fermentation, as I mentioned before, wreaks havoc on the colorectal area, greatly increases the risk of disease there. The reason why is because, has anyone ever seen an animal on the side of the road after they've been hit? Most often we'll see deer on the side of the road. What happens to them after a day or two? Worms, right? But they also start to puff up, right? Why does this happen? It's actually a process called putrefaction. Putrefaction is decaying protein, protein matter that goes from a structure that's recognizable to a liquid form and finally back to the dust, right? From the dust to the dust is the, the story of the plight of mankind and God's creation right now. But interestingly enough, if you remove the colon, from a corpse, you greatly slow the putrefaction process. In fact, the ancient Egyptians used to, if they were going to mummify the remains of someone who just passed away, they had a narrow window of time in which they could actually remove the colon and preserve that body. If they removed the colon, they were okay. But if it was delayed, then there's really little they could do because those bacteria would proliferate there. They would start eating the protein here and destroying the whole body. But the interesting thing is, we can have destruction in our spoons and our forks, on our plates, and we're eating that, and we have this putrefaction that's taking place. Those bacteria that cause putrefaction in the system are going to thrive with this type of diet. So we could either have plant-based bacteria that is probably going to be engendering our health or increasing our health, or we can have this putrefying type of bacteria. And studies have found that depending on our diet depends on the type. It actually makes a difference in what bacterial flora we actually have. If you go from a plant-based diet to an animal-based diet, your bacterial flora completely changes in a very short amount of time. Whereas if you switch back to a plant-based diet, it changes again. So it really makes a huge difference uh, in terms of what our diet is and what our overall colon health is. Even if we take probiotic organisms that are going to be helpful, we may relieve some of the problems, but the diet is really, really important. If we don't get that right, we can try all these other things and it's not going to give us the full maximum benefit of colon health. Okay, let's go to a different type of fermentation. We covered the lactic acid fermentation. And the heterofermenting um, bacteria actually are following something called mixed lactic acid fermentation. So they have a variety of it, kind of a mix between these two, alcoholic fermentation and the lactic acid fermentation. But let's talk about just alcoholic fermentation now. Alcoholic fermentation is fermentation that produces just ethanol and carbon dioxide. So if you want to raise bread, this is going to be your fastest leavening agent. Now, what do you think this is? Yeast. Why do we use baker's yeast? Because it produces a large amount of gas. And that's a good thing for leavening the bread. But you know what? We don't necessarily want a large amount of gas and a large amount of ethanol in our colon. So I'll submit to you, yeast is not a probiotic organism. It should never be a dominant organism in the colon shouldn't have large amounts of it there because it's going to produce large amounts of ethanol and large amounts of gas and bloating. Where do we get yeast from? Well, usually from leaven products. 60 to 70% of people with Crohn's disease have antibodies to this yeast. What does that mean? When they eat it, they're going to have an immune response. They might even have tissue destruction in their colon because they're eating this again. So this leads me to my next question. How do we make sure that the yeast that we use to leaven our bread, or maybe even one of those hetero-fermenting lactobacilli that produce 
lactic acid, ethanol, and carbon dioxide, how do we make sure that they're killed so we can enjoy this softer bread instead of just eating flatbread all the time? How do we do that? Well, like this bread uh, is depicted right here, it is nice and dry. It's, it's been cooked thoroughly. What does water do? Well, let me put it like this. What does water do for our engines? What does a radiator do? It keeps the temperature from getting too high. The same thing happens here when we cook. And so if we have a pocket of uh, dense pocket of moist dough in the middle still after we've cooked our bread, we're going to potentially have some live yeast in there. And we don't want to be putting that directly into our system. We may get a few spores here and there. And if we have a good strong microbiome already, then it shouldn't really be a problem. But we don't want to put large amounts of it into our system. So it's important for us to make sure the bread is cooked thoroughly. Now here's another little tidbit of information a lot of people are unaware of. And that is that once you bake a loaf of bread and you've used one of these leavening um, organisms to do it, you're going to have something still in the bread. You know what that is? It's ethanol, ethanol alcohol. And sometimes you can have a substantial amount because for, for just about every part of ethanol, you're going to have the carbon dioxide and maybe even some methane gas being produced. So you need to let that kind of air out. The nice thing to do with bread is to leave it out for a few hours, especially when it first is baked, and let that volatile or the evaporative uh, compounds come off of the loaf. You'll actually get a much healthier loaf of bread. It will be missing the methanol, or the byproducts of the fermentation here, the alcoholic fermentation. And then really the ideal is to leave it out for about 24 hours. You have a much healthier loaf of bread at that time. A lot of people think that leaving it out actually kills the yeast. It doesn't kill the yeast. What it will do though, it, it will allow probiotic organisms to potentially start to recolonize the bread. So you may have more probiotic bacteria in the bread after 24 hours. And that's a, a nice little thing to have happen, right? Your supplementation right here just coming from the bread. Now we know if we leave bread out too long, what's going to happen? The fungus will come back, right? And not a way that uh, the initial yeast came. Yeast is a one-celled organism. But what comes on the bread afterward is called a mold. It's a fungus as well, but it kind of spreads out. It's a different structure. It's more like a filament type structure. Um, that develops over some kind of living, well in this case, uh, decaying matter. It's common to see molds growing on our fruit and vegetables. But what about fungus? I said before that we probably don't want to put large amounts of fungus, those individual organisms, into our digestive tract. We definitely wouldn't consider them a probiotic because they're mainly producing the ethanol and carbon dioxide. Ethanol, which breaks apart the tight junctions there that line the colon and the cells, and producing gas, which could cause bloating. So, what can we do to distinguish a fruit that might have some fungus growing on it? Well, you don't really need to look at it under a microscope. Just look for these. Studies have found that fruit flies are actually attracted to fungus growing on fruit and vegetables. So if you have a banana over here on the shelf and you notice one day there's like a hundred fruit flies sitting on it, don't eat it. It's not worth it. Why is that? Because there's fungus there. The fruit fly is attracted by the smell, the, the byproducts that are put off when that fungus is growing there. So it's not worth eating. And not just because you're going to get some potentially bad organisms growing in the colon. Now, this is a full-blown mold right here. But because these mold, in particular, produce toxins. This is the penicillium mold. Anyone ever heard of penicillin? Penicillin comes from penicillium mold. A lot of people have this growing in their attics. 
and they're getting doses of this penicillium. They might go and get uh, allergy tests and realize they're deadly allergic to penicillin, but they've never had penicillin before. Well, they might have had it through the air that's come down in their attic because these molds readily produce these byproducts. They're known as mycotoxins, and they're used to kill bacteria or other organisms that might compete with their, their living space. So do you think it would be healthy for us to have mycotoxins being produced in the colon? Anyone? Well, the good news is that most molds will not grow in the colon. They don't grow very well in an anaerobic environment. I'm thankful for that. I hope you all are as well. But there is a fungus that has mold-like characteristics that can grow in the colon. And this is it right here. Look like little uh, mines in a minefield or something, but uh, really that's kind of how they are in function. This is known as the dread fungus Candida albicans. Now the whole Candida species kind of exhibit this same growth pattern. This is in the normal uh, fungus state or yeast stage of the Candida. They're the one-celled organism. And when they're like this, they don't really cause problems. But here's what happens when candida really gets bad, and that is when it starts to become more like a filament. It actually looks like a mold. Candida breaks over. It's called a dimorphic fungi. It can break over from being a one-cell yeast to looking more and functioning more like a mold in the body. And it's not very nice either. These things right here, these appendages, it uses to sink down into the cells it's trying to infect. And so you've seen the white coating sometimes you get from candida, someone might have. This candida is actually sunk into the underlying structures and it causes tissue damage. It causes uh, uh, immune reactions. It causes inflammation. Here's a microscopic look at this growth here. You see the fungus-like growth or the mold-like growth here? This is a normal uh, section, uh, microscopic look at the, at the colon. These are uh, normal bacterial flora, but over here there are none. All we see are the candida and this filament type growth right here. Here's another filament type growth associated with candida. In this study, it found that mice that were treated with vancomycin, which is an antibiotic, it killed all the normal flora in the digestive, in the um, colon, and the candida overgrew. It's almost like candida is just there waiting and watching in this yeast um, disguise. And when this, the conditions are right, it breaks out into this mold-like fungus and causes massive destruction and damage. So we don't want this organism to become the dominant organism in the body, in the, in the colon. What do I mean by dominant? I mean the organism that kind of heads everything. He's like the, the um, minor, uh, majority in terms of the amount of his species that are there in the colon. You definitely don't want a yeast, or in this case, uh, a yeast turned almost um, mold growing there in the colon. What do we want? Many of these bacteria are very loving, so to speak. They don't mind sharing their habitation with others. But when you get the yeast and the, the mold-like organisms, they want to dominate. And a lot of these uh, bacteria, they're disease-causing, they want to dominate and destroy. But it's kind of like a, this dichotomy where you have good and evil potentially there in the microbiome. Remember what we said about heterofermenters? Heterofermenters were those bacteria, in particular of the lactobacilli uh, family, that produce some lactic acid, which could be potentially beneficial, but they also produce the ethanol and the carbon dioxide. Now, one thing we didn't mention was that studies have shown something very interesting occurs when we have higher than normal amounts of carbon dioxide in an anaerobic environment. Want to know what it is? Remember we talked about mold and how mold doesn't grow very well in an anaerobic environment? 
Well, studies have found that the more carbon dioxide you have, even if you don't have oxygen, if you have carbon dioxide, mold can grow in an anaerobic environment. Now, I know that no one here wants a moldy colon, right? Because of the byproducts. Think about this, that mold will be sticking its appendages down there into the epithelium, producing mycotoxins, creating leaky gut, all these things. So maybe carbon dioxide doesn't seem so harmful on the surface, but if we have more than normal amounts of it in the colon, we could have causative factors of bringing about that transformation of the candida from the yeast to the mold-like form. I really enjoy studying populations and doing demographic studies and historical studies. And one interesting population I came across that was very knowledgeable about the colon was one that I just mentioned, the ancient Egyptians. I told you they removed the colon because they realized if they didn't, the body would putrefy. They also were very keen on using enemas. Hippocrates tells us that they routinely use the enema twice a week. That's pretty impressive considering the fact that uh, we think of the Egyptians to be so primitive, but their medical system was actually very highly um, developed, highly stratified. They had cardiologists for heart diseases. They had endocrinologists for organ disorders. They had all sorts of specialists that were trying to take care of the diseases of the population there with the common Egyptians. They even had probiotic drinks they would drink. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But you know, the interesting thing is they rarely live past 30 years old for the common Egyptian during this time. That's startling, isn't it? How many of you would think that's a ripe old age to pass away at, 30 years of age? And look at what they were dying from. Infectious diseases, osteoarthritis, and alcoholism. This is an interesting one here. Where, why were they dying from alcoholism? Well, it's because their primary beverage was beer. Um, they consumed this instead of water. They thought that water from the Nile was more contaminated than they wanted to drink, so they would brew this uh, Egyptian beer, which was about 3 to 4 percent alcohol by uh, volume, and it used wild yeast, which we would think, well, that's probably a healthier form of yeast. It's a symbiotic blend of all different things they found growing in the environment, which would include probably some bacteria as well. And it was unfiltered, so that means it had some of that bacteria still there. It was a probiotic drink. Interesting reports showed that some of the wages of the Egyptians, the Egyptian common laborers, were paid up to six liters a day. And they would drink, imagine drinking six liters of beer a day. No wonder they were dying at 30 years of age. No wonder they were suffering from alcoholism. But look at what they were drinking. It was a 3 to 4% concentration alcoholic beverage with wild yeast, probiotic organisms, unfiltered. Now, remember these criteria here. But they couldn't keep the Egyptians, along with two enemas a week, they couldn't keep the Egyptians alive past 30 years of age for the common Egyptian. Something was going on here. What was the factor? Let me introduce you to kombucha. You ever seen this? Kombucha is a probiotic or, um, organism based drink that actually uh, a lot of people brew at home or they buy in the health food store. What do you see over here? You want to see these? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. What do you think might be being made here in this kombucha? If you've got, eth if you've got, I just gave it away. If you've got carbon dioxide, you probably also have Ethanol, okay? Now this is what the culture medium looks like. It doesn't look too appetizing. But people take that out and they'll throw it away or eat it maybe. And some companies even bottle it and it looks like this. It's very popular, highly popular. But studies have found something very interesting. And these are my own personal studies. This is my very hand here <laughs> holding this kombucha. I turned it around to the back and I saw something very amazing. It said, please note, kombucha is a fermented tea that has naturally occurring alcohol. Do not consume if you are avoiding alcohol due to pregnancy, allergies, sensitivities, or religious beliefs. I thought, oh, that's very interesting. So it's using things 
uh, that I later found out were, that were considered wild yeast and some probiotic organisms as well in here. But in 2010, Whole Foods realized that something was not quite right with their kombucha they had. Um, it wasn't the one that they made potentially, but it was another brand that they were selling. They realized, you know what? We're kind of concerned because the FDA set a limit in terms of what they classify an alcoholic beverage at 0.5%. And we're selling kombucha to children. We're selling it to anyone who wants to buy it. Now, let me give you a little example here about alcohol content. Average wine has about 9 to 16% uh, alcohol. The average beer has about 5%. Light beers have about 2.6%. You know what many kombuchas have in terms of their alcoholic content? 3%. They're an alcoholic beverage. How are they made? They're made the same way in many cases that the Egyptians were making their alcoholic probiotic brew. By taking wild yeast, by fermenting it in some sugary substance, and then drinking it as a health-promoting beverage. But they were suffering from alcoholism because of that. Now at 3% alcohol, as I said before, that's a light beer. I was talking to a recovering alcoholic just the other day, and she told me, you know what? I am glad that you told me about this because I was getting ready to try some of this. And if I tried that, I'd be back on the binge again because that's a beer right there. And there are many people who are drinking this unaware. I talked to one individual, I've given these seminars a number of places across the country, talked to one individual, she said, you know what, Ron, I don't think it has any alcohol. This was before I knew the percentage. She said, I just get this nice feeling of well-being every time I drink it. And, and, and I, told, I actually told that to the um, recovering alcoholic. She says, I know what that is, that's a buzz. That's not a nice thing to have happening. That's the alcohol speaking to you. And so people who maybe have never touched alcohol in their lives and, go, and run the other way from it, they're becoming used to drinking these things, these alcoholic beverages. And true, there may be some probiotic organisms in there, but there's also ethanol, right? There's alcohol. And what else? There's yeast. So the same organism that produced the alcohol here could potentially produce it here and cause leaky gut. So is it really solving the problem of lack of probiotic organisms that are potentially healing the gut? No, it's probably not. It's probably taking one step forward and two steps back. But I'll submit to you, it is grabbing a lot of customers. Kefir, uh, home kefir has a little bit less alcohol because it's not fermented as long. But even kefir, kefir grains are, um, uh, it's like a wild type yeast as well, has probiotic bacteria as well, but you will get eventually uh, in the store-bought kefir potentially up to 1 to 2% alcohol. And what do you have here? You have these wild yeasts that are also going to produce alcohol down in the gut as well. So not the ideal in terms of probiotics or in terms of beverages. Some people are not quite sure about the detriment of alcohol in general. There was an interesting study that was published a number of years ago. It was the first study that found um, that there was a relationship between alcohol consumption and stickiness of the platelets. But this is what they had to say. These results in no way indicate or recommend the use of alcohol as a preventative agent. This is from the European Heart Journal. I think it was 1994 it was first produced. Why is that? Because it's true that the platelets might have been suppressed in terms of their stickiness, but ethanol is not good. It's a toxin to every tissue in the body. And so this is the reason why they said it's not a good thing for us to be consuming it for health reasons. Interesting fact, even mild drinking, even drinking small amounts of alcohol can cause problems with our health. A little under two glasses of red wine increased duration of GERD by 17 times compared with water. That's 17x. That's not 17%. It's 17 times more GERD. So for every one person that had GERD, 17 more would have GERD if they're drinking this wine.
two glasses of red wine. Consuming less than one full glass of wine increased the risk of stomach cancer by 36% compared to non-drinkers. So you have to ask the question then, why is it that the alcoholic beverage industry is promulgating the idea that a glass of wine is good for your health? Does anyone know? Well, ethanol is addictive. It's an addictive substance. That's why alcoholism is the end result sometimes of even moderate drinking, because it's addictive. But even for milder drinkers, you can still have some of these ill health effects. But you still have that propensity to develop a mild addiction to this, to even social drinking. Anytime you mix an addictive substance with something healthy, you know what you have? You have poison in disguise. And if you disguise a poison, people will be much more readily interested in it than if you outright say this is toxic, it's bad for you. And so the alcoholic beverage industry now has a reason that they can push their product on unsuspecting people claiming that it's actually very beneficial for your health. But it would behoove us to understand that there are healthier alternatives.